Welcome to Cat Tutorials, and in this video, I will be so. This is basically the first video under the function se section. And to start with, I'm going to talk about parabolas. And these are so this section, or the first few sections, can be said to be revision in a way. So this is basically revision because it is assumed that you guys actually did this in grade 11, but you have to know the stuff and that is why you basically have to revise it. So to start, as I said, we're going to be doing parabolas. So let's, let's get right into it. There are three possible configurations or three possible forms that a uh, parabola can be described. So let's talk about the first form. First form. And that would be the following form given to you as y is equals to a multiplied by x subtract p squared plus q. And now I'm basically just going to explain all of these variables and how they actually define the parabola. So let's start with P. So P is known to be the X coordinate of your turning point. So let's say you have a parabola, which, which uh, looks something like this. So this one is increasing at this particular point. At this particular point, this parabola can be split in half, and that is where you essentially have your turning point. And so the x coordinate of your turning point would be p. That is what this description says. And you have to have your description in this form. This value over here has to be negative for you to have the correct form of this equation. But P, when you substitute your P here, it shouldn't be negative P, it should just be P. So when you have your equation in this form and you have a value over here and it comes here, it actually has the form or the value of, so whatever you have inside this bracket, which is usually just like this. So your X will be X minus P equals to zero. So your x for your turning point will be p. So this is how you basically compute the value. It is quite rare to actually have this uh, this part over here as positive, but if you do, then just basically know that in that bracket you basically have x subtract, and then this will also be a square of some sort. But essentially. Or ideally, you just want your equation to be in this form so that you can take your p as the value, which is the x coordinate of your turning point. Right? So now we are going to move on to talk about other variables which are found in this equation, which you have in front of you. So other values include q. So let's talk about Q next. So Q is over here. So here you have your Q and Q is the Y coordinate of your turning point of the turning point. So now again, you come back to that point, which indicates the half point of your parabola and you're going to have a value Q. Now this Q, whatever value which it carries over here, so this value that it actually carries as well as the sign, actually take the sign, so if this were negative, you'd actually have negative Q over here. If this were positive, then you basically just take it as it is. It's not treated as you treat your P, right? So that's, that's basically the first form of the parabola. And we're basically going to talk about some other things which are common among all of the forms of these parabolas. But let's move along for now to the second form, which you might expect. So the second form you might expect a parabola is y equals to ax squared 
plus bx plus c which is your general quadratic formula your general quadratic form because essentially your parabola is a quadratic function and this form you have a you have b you have c so previously to find the x coordinate of your turning point you came to the p but now here you actually have to do this which is x is equals to minus b divided by 2a and this value will give you or this formula will give you the x coordinates of your turning point which is the same point as you'd have there at p so to find that same point of the turning point you just say minus b divided by 2a minus b divided by 2 multiplied by a that is and another point of interest in this form or in this equation of the second form is c so c and c will give you the y-intercept of your parabola so this is the y-intercept of your parabola so c is the y-intercept and then you're going to use b and a to find the x coordinate of your turning point so basically to find your y-intercept you just have to substitute the value of x back into this formula to find your y which corresponds with the y coordinate of your turning point in the first part or in the first form you basically have both of those coordinates but in this one you basically just first have to find your x then after finding your x you substitute it back into the equation to find the y right that's basically what you have to do in the second form we now move on to the third form of your representations of parabolas and let's just leave all of that there and come down here so the third form which you expect looks something like this you basically have y equals to a multiplied by x subtract r1 and another bracket with the x subtract r2 and this or both of these r1 and r2 indicates so let's come to this thing which i have here and haven't used at all so if you look at this equation over here it has r1 and r2 so the values which you have here so you, you can just basically say r uh, x subtract r1 equals to zero or if this were positive you basically say x plus whatever you have in the bracket you create that to zero to find the correct value or the correct form of your r so basically have this and here you'd have your x equals to r2 so now your r1 and your r2 both of these give you the x intercepts of your parabola so this is the x these are the x intercepts of your parabola and this is what this basically means so if you had let's say let's give an example of two um, so let's say a formula like this this is just an example let's say you had x subtract um, what can we use we can use two as well and we can have what can we have next we can have something like four over here so this is what this basically means if you ask to sketch this or if you ask to find the intercepts your parabola will basically look something like this. This is just a rough sketch and not the exact form you'd expect. So at this point, you'd have your R1. Your R1 in this case would be x equals to 2. And your other intercept would be x equals to 4. So this just basically means you have your graph crossing these two points. x equals to R1 and x equals to R2. So at this point, you expect to have 2, 0. And at this point, because these are the x-intercepts, your y will be 0 for both of them. And then here, you have 4, 0. So from both of these, just a note, from both of these, you can basically find the middle point or your turning point over here. Because your parabola is symmetrical with respect to your turning point. So if you have to move two units to go to that side, and you have to move two units to go to that side 
or something like that. So basically, it just computes the, the difference between these two. So 4 subtract 2 is basically 2. So you don't actually move two units to either side. You actually move one unit. So at this point, we can actually conclude that it's 3 and it has a corresponding value of y, which we don't know at the moment. Because, so this is the x of your turning point. Because these intercepts will tell you about the symmetry of your parabola. So you can actually calculate where you expect to find your turning point. So you're going to move one unit to the right to get to four. You're going to move one unit to the left to get to two because this is symmetrical. And therefore, you know that the value which you can only add or subtract one, two to get either, either of these values is three. And that is how you basically find your turning point from this third form of your parabola. So now we're just going to discuss some other things which are related to parabolas, which are quite useful. So let's start with A. So as you saw, all of them, or basically, yeah, basically all of them have, let me just write them down again. All of them basically have this value or this variable, which is a, right? All of them basically have a and their formulas. And now I'm just going to discuss the role of this a. And so basically what you can use a for, or what you can tell about the parabola when you have a value of a, or when you look at the sign of a, whether it's negative or positive, and as you can see, my handwriting is getting better in a way from the previous video, which I did. So that's good. So if you look at A, when your A is positive, you actually have an increasing function, which looks like this. So your parabola will point up when you have A greater than zero, which means it is increasing. Right? And as you increase this value of a from zero to let's say one, your graph actually will compress or it will actually move inwards. So let's say you have zero, you go to maybe a half, then you go to maybe a quarter. So basically the quarter and the half will be on the outside. So the smaller ones will be on the outside. That is what you expect. You basically have a quarter on the outside. You basically have, let's say, a half on the inside. So as you increase, and maybe one in here. So the final graph, which is the green graph, let's, let's just say that it's an estimation. Let's just say it's one or something like that. So as you increase your values, zero, um, one over four, a half, whatever value which follows or to one, as you move from zero to one, you basically expect, expect your graph to narrow down. So for something like one over four, which is a small fraction, you basically expect your graph to be wider. But for something like one, you expect your graph to be narrower. So that is what you can infer. That is what you can conclude from the value of A. If it is positive, you have, as some textbooks actually denote it, you have a smiley face. So basically, that is a terrible smiley face, but I hope you get the point. You have a smiley face, and your graph is increasing. And also, if you have a value which is increasing, so as your value for A increases towards 1, you basically have a narrower graph, and that is what I basically showed here. And... So let's look at the other case of A. So if your A is negative, so let's say A is negative. So for A negative, you basically have a frowning face or something like that. So your graph actually looks down and it is decreasing, right? And you are basically going to move from, so you're going to do the inverse or the opposite of what you did to find the form of compression. So as you move from zero towards the negative values, towards the negative values, 
you expect to find um, an arrowing action. So as you move from zero and maybe move on to negative 1.4, basically have a narrower graph. So if this were something like um, one point, this is a, a quarter, negative a quarter, and you have negative half. So basically that is, that is the same principle as you, as you go towards the smaller values, you expect your graph to be narrower. So here, as you increase the values, so for a greater than zero, as you increase the values, your graph became narrower. So as you increase your values, the graph became narrower. But here, as you decrease the value, your graph becomes narrower. So that is where the difference is. But the principle is essentially the same. So that is all about the value A or the variable A in all of the forms. It basically dictates if the graph is increasing or decreasing, as well as the shape in terms of narrowing or compression. And we're now going to move on to Q and C again. So let's come uh, uh, let's come up to these two, the first two basically. So you have your Q over here. Apart from it being the y-intercept of your turning point, it can also dictate whether your graph goes up or down. So if you had a negative Q. This would mean that you'd actually have a graph which has, so let's say negative Q somewhere here. So your graph would actually be somewhere there. So it actually cut somewhere there because you know this Q to be the Y value of your, you know this Q to be the Y value of your turning point. So if the turning point has a Y value which is negative, then your graph actually has to go down to the negative side. But if this so if this Q were positive, then it actually come up to some point, let's say here, it doesn't really matter where you draw it, depending on your graph, it will differ. But as you can see, the effect of Q is that if it's positive, it's, it's a coordinate of the turning point. So the turning point is, the, is either the lowest or the highest point of the graph. So that's another note to make for each of these. And I'm going to make it when I move on to domains and ranges. So this is the turning point over here. And if it's, if it's Y is positive, it actually has to find itself above this line. And if the Y coordinate, which is Q, is negative, it actually has to find itself below the line. So you can see Q as a value which dictates whether your graph goes up or down. So positive Q takes the graph up or it takes the parabola up. The negative Q takes the parabola down. That is what I basically showed with the arrows. And in the second form of the equation, this C essentially performs the same action. So your C determines whether the parabola goes up or it goes down. So that, that is basically it. Your Q and your C dictates the position of your parabola, whether it goes up or down. So whether you want, when you want to manipulate your, your shifting of the graph, whether you want to take the graph up or down, you just basically change the value of Q or C depending on the form of equation which you have. And that brings me to the last form of translations or, or movements. So this P over here, it controls the horizontal movements. So taking this general form of X minus P, so let's say a P is positive, so it's, it's basically two, right? Let's say your P is two over here. So you'd expect your your P to occur maybe some of this side on this side. So if it's positive, so if you have X minus P equals to zero, which is X equals to P, 
that is positive, then your parabola will actually occur on this positive side of the y-axis. And if your p is negative, so in here, you basically have x plus p, because your p is negative, it goes to zero, which means x equals to negative p. So if your p is negative, then you'd expect your graph to occur somewhere here. So for a negative p, your graph will occur to the left of your y-axis. This is the y-axis. This is the x. And if your p is positive, you expect your graph to occur to the right of the y-axis. So this is the p to summarize. Let me summarize somewhere here. Your p is for your horizontal translations, either left or right, and your q is for your vertical translation, either up or down. So Q and C are for horizontal, are for vertical. This is vertical. And your P is for your horizontal translations. So that is basically all with regards to A, P, Q, and C. So now let me clear this because a lot of things are on the screen now. I cleared everything and we are now going to look at the final point which I want to discuss about parabolas. So that is the domain and range. Right. So the domain and range which I want to discuss just now. So the domain actually describes the domain describes the values of x which are covered by your parabola. So if you have a parabola like this, and another one which maybe looks like this, if you are to analyze both of these, here's what you notice. This is the x-axis, and you basically have arrows associated with all of these. They, they don't just end here. So they have arrows associated with them, which shows that they actually continue infinitely. So both of them continue infinitely on either side of the x axis. So your domain, a domain by definition is the x values covered by a function. So if they ask you, what is the domain of the blue graph, what would you say? So the answer to that would be the blue graph covers all the values. So it covers all the values from negative infinity up to positive infinity because it goes on and on infinitely. It goes on in that direction, goes on in that direction, and therefore... Your domain or the domain of a parabola so x you denote it like this this is the first form which you can denote it or you can say x consists of all values from negative infinity to positive infinity right so those are all the neg the the values along the x axis or those are all the x values which the parabola covers so whether it's positive or negative, as you can see from, from this one as well, it goes on and on. So it covers all of the values because we aren't told where these arrows stop. So they just go on and on and on and on. <coughs> so, excuse me, we come to the range now. So now I'm going to mention a point which I mentioned in passing. Previously, when I was talking about P and Q. So we know that the turning point has coordinates of P, Q, if we have the first form, which I introduced. So this means that if we know the values P and Q, or if we know the coordinates of the turning points, we can determine the domain, uh, so the domain is already given, so it can basically determine the, the range from, from this coordinate, or from the coordinates of the turning points. And the range is essentially a description of the y values covered 
by a function. So if we are to discuss the, the range of, so let me, okay, let me try to use different colors for both of these. So I can refer to either as one being red and the other being, let's say, black. So if I were asked to find the range of the black the black graph over here. If I ask to find the range of the black graph, you notice that your turning point is either the so turning point is either the max value or the minimum, depending on whether the graph is increasing or decreasing. So if your graph is increasing, if your graph is increasing, then the turning point is the minimum value. So look at this graph over here. It's increasing. So our turning point is the lowest value which the graph can take because from here it's only going up. And if the graph is decreasing, which is the black graph over here, this is the maximum value or this is the highest value because now it's actually going to go down into the negatives and the value of your Q will just continue being negative because negative one is greater than negative a thousand. So it goes on and on into the negatives. And that is why this point over here is the maximum of the graph. So we're now interested in finding the, the range and the range is a description of all the Y values covered by the function. So to describe the range, of your parabola, you basically look at your turning point and say that y is greater equals to q, which is your turning point. So this is for an increasing function. So if a greater than zero, we can also denote this as y. Now using a square, square bracket because you actually include the value of q you can't include the values of infinity because we don't know what infinity is and that is why you have a round bracket for the infinity and you have a square bracket for a value which you actually include which is q it's included in the graph over there and that is why it has a square bracket on its side and also for a decreasing graph you're going to say y less equals to q and that is if a is less than zero and that basically is the same as writing in this form so from negative infinity so you always start with a small one as i just previously mentioned that your q is actually the maximum so you actually start with a small one and go to the big one so q in the case of an increasing graph is your minimum and in the case of your decreasing graph, it's a maximum. And that is why we start from negative infinity to the point Q. So that is your description of your range of parabolas. So that is basically it in this video. I talked a lot about all of these points just to make sure you guys understand or just to make sure that you guys actually get the stuff. And so I just wanted to focus on parabolas for this video and in my next video I'll be talking about another form of function or another form which you have to revise or to know before we proceed to what you actually have to cover in grade 12 and stuff but this will also be part of it you have to have to have to know this and that is basically all for me in this video if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And if you like the video, don't hesitate. Just give it a thumbs up. I'll see you in the next video.